the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This story is one of those few times in the gospel where the disciples are not with Jesus in the readings. Matthew says that Jesus told the disciples to get in a boat and go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee while he goes to a mountain to rest and to pray. If you'll remember, he tried to do that last week with the 5,000, but they prevented him. Now, going to the other side of the Sea of Galilee sounds simple enough, but it is not. The sea is 8 miles wide. It is 13 miles long. And that might not seem like a lot to you and to me, but 8 miles with Boat paddles and oars is a long way. Then the story changes, it shifts, and a storm seems to come out of nowhere. Now, this is not just any old normal storm. It was enough to scare men who were seasoned veterans of the sea. They had endured hundreds of rainstorms before, so the idea of clouds, of wind, of waves, of rain. It didn't scare them. It did not detour them from the sea. They wouldn't panic at the sight of such. But this storm is different. This one terrifies the disciples. Matthew often reveals the flaws and the struggles of Jesus' disciples. He's not afraid to put them in difficult positions and watch them struggle for their faith. And nor is Matthew, throughout his whole gospel, hesitant to show their shortcomings when they choose fear instead of faith. Now, when I look at this passage, I see a spiritual struggle. But it's not between the wind and the boat. It's not between the disciples and the devil. I believe it is a spiritual struggle between fear and faith. Jesus even said at one point in the reading that people were of little faith. So when we look at that and we think about that, the passage really hits home because it invites us to confront our fears during our dark moments, during our storms of life. That's exactly what Jesus does here. He allows his disciples to confront their fear. But then he takes that fear and he uses it. He even transforms it so that it can teach them a lesson about faith. And there are three things that I see when I look at this passage about faith. And first and foremost, faith requires persistence. Have you ever wondered why Jesus didn't just instantly rescue the disciples? That's a legitimate question. He's on a mountain. Mountains surround the Sea of Galilee. You can see for miles. Certainly, he could see his disciples struggling on the sea. But he allows it to continue. The NRSV, you can look at it in your bulletin, says that this lasted until early in the morning. That's actually a horrible translation. The actual Greek says that in the third watch of the night, Jesus came to them. The third watch began at 3 a.m. So from sundown to 3 a.m., he allows them to struggle. And it makes me wonder, did they get mad about it? Did they get mad at God? Did they blame God? Jesus, where are you? I mean, if, if you really loved us, why is this happening? Or maybe they talk to God, you know, often like we do. Let me be honest about that this morning. I talk to God sometimes. It's very direct. He and I have a good relationship like that. I talk and he listens. Sounds something like this. God, I have done everything that I can do to be a good person. But still, I'm struggling with this problem, and it seems like my prayers are unanswered. So if we put that into this text.
text, it would sound something like this. God, it's three in the morning. I've been in this storm all night long, and I'm exhausted. I've prayed for healing and hope and reconciliation between these members of my family, and I've rowed the boat until my arms are tired. And God, it seems like these other folks in the boat, it, it seems like they're just not doing their part. You ever felt that way? Oh God, I'm the only one in Israel who has not bowed a knee to Baal. God, I've been living in this constant state of anxiety since this storm swept into my life. But I'm afraid to tell anyone in the boat about it because we're all such strong people of faith. And we follow Jesus. They might think less of me if I admit what I really struggle with. We understand those kinds of questions, those kind of storms all too well. We endured a Category 5 hurricane. We wanted to, to quit at times. Trees everywhere. But what did we do? We persisted. We continued to work. I kept running my chainsaw. You kept hammering nails. We all kept picking up garbage and trash. And like the disciples, we refused to give up. We continued to row our boat, even if it seemed like we were getting nowhere and the mountain of work had not decreased. You see, faith requires persistence. But it also requires trust. Terrifying word. Trust is to surrender ourselves in hope that our vulnerabilities and our fears will not be exploited by other people. You know, if we really look back, we look back at the story of Jesus and the disciples in the boat, or the disciples rather in the boat, we find that there is a moment where they are required to trust in Jesus. They notice this silhouette that's removed from them, but they can't make out what it is through the waves and the wind and the rain. It might be a man, but how could a man be out here in the middle of the sea? And then one of them says, well, maybe it's a ghost. Sounds crazy, but there was actually a tradition among first century sailors that makes their fear make sense. The tradition said that Right before a sailor died in a storm, the ghosts of other sailors who had perished in the sea would come to guide them into the afterlife. Now, if that's the case, no wonder the disciples are terrified. Somebody's coming to get me and take me out of here. But then we see Peter. He steps up. He sees what he thinks is Jesus, and he asks if this is Jesus. Peter was always that disciple willing to take action. Even when he's wrong, at least he does something. He doesn't sit and twiddle his thumbs. He was wrong often. That's why he's my favorite of the apostles. But what I appreciate about him is his willingness to put his faith on the poker table and to push his chips into the center and say, I'm all in. We watched him when he pushed his chips to the center when he places his life on hold to follow Jesus. And we see it again here when he looks at Jesus and he says, if that's you, then I'm putting my fears behind me and I'm going to step out of this boat trusting that you are calling me and that you will save me. I played some cards it's terrifying to go all in on the block. Y'all hear me? If Peter sinks into these waves in the middle of the night, they'll never see him again. But he goes all in. He climbs out of the boat. And we see him in a space that is between safety and Christ. Now think about it. That makes me wonder, what are our boats? Where are, we, where are we most comfortable? 
What are the things that seem to anchor us to our fear and keep us from really stepping out and finding Jesus? Sometimes it's our traditions, our addiction, our families. No matter what it might be, things prevent us from really going after Christ and sharing Christ with others. Sometimes all people are waiting for is somebody to step out of the boat so that they can follow. So Peter, he steps out, and he makes his way to Jesus. Now what's terrifying, my friends, is that space between the boat, between safety, between normality, and Christ. That liminal space where we exist in trust can be terrifying. Because Jesus, he doesn't lift Peter out of the boat. Oh no, Peter has to step out on his own. It's a powerful method. Can we trust God even when we do not understand? Can we persist? Can we trust? And then the third, faith requires focus. Peter's courage, it gets him out of this boat, all right, but his eyes then become informed by what's happening around him. And he loses his focus on what matters the most, which is Jesus. He begins to sink as he notices all this danger that surrounds him, and fear overcomes him. And now his faith is at risk. Again, there's Matthew's theme, fear and faith. So let me just, let me stop here for a moment. When we're anxious about what's going on around us, what we're seeing around us. And what I mean is, you know, that ever-present 24-hour news cycle that continually tells us just how bad the world actually is. When we lose focus on the love of God, the mercy of God, God's justice, peace, and redemption, and focus all of our attention on the wind and the waves, our faith can begin to sink. It's all an issue for Peter of focus. And then when Jesus sees Peter sinking, he says something to him that troubled me. Well, when I first read it, it made me mad. He says, oh, you of little faith. When I read that last Monday, I crossed my arms at my desk and I said, you know, Jesus, that seems a little harsh to me. After all, the man just got out of the boat and walked on water trying to get to you in the middle of a storm. And then you're going to step back and criticize him because he don't have enough faith. Come on, Jesus. What is this about? But then I asked myself the question, and it's simply a question. It's certainly not doctrine here. What if it's not as harsh as it really sounds up front. Could it be something like saying, well, Peter, you had faith and persistence in the storm. You had enough faith to trust me when you stepped out of the boat. But now you're letting your eyes control you. Don't give all of your energy, Peter, to your eyes just because you do not like what you see. Have as much faith with your eyes as you did with your heart and your courage. You know, sometimes we, we don't have enough faith in God. Sometimes we don't have enough faith in others. We are of little faith at times toward community and toward uh, our fellow friends around us. I read a story last week that moved my hope in humanity up a couple of notches. Story, July 24th, 2020, Central Wisconsin. Two men made a promise to one another in 1992 that if one of them won the Powerball jackpot, they would split the winnings. And then nearly 30 years later, one of the men did win. And here's the real miracle. He made good on his word and on his handshake. See, it, it, happened, it happened in July. Thomas Cook bought a Powerball ticket, and he ended up hitting the jackpot. And after he learned that he won $22 million, 
He called his friend, Joe Feeney, and he told him the news. Well, of course, Joe is like, hey, this is not even funny. Don't mess with me like this. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Finances are out of control. I'm struggling. I'm suffering. This is not the time for these kinds of jokes. But he said, no, did we not shake hands 30 years ago? And despite all of the odds, beside all of the, the ego's desire to pour to itself, he made good on his promise. Now, the overall odds of winning the Powerball jackpot on that uh, weekend are 1 in 292,201,338.7 million. That's the discriminating factor, the decimal. But he did it. So what are the odds of us having faith in others? Oh, ye of little faith. 